All right, well, good morning, church. Listen, for those of you who, uh, who don't know me, my name is Will Franco, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here at the church, and uh, so good to be with you here. I'm usually up in Streamwood at our Tri-Village campus, uh, and so I get to be here about once a month. And so if you're new here, I would love to get a chance to meet you. I'll be here by the front at the end of the service. would love to shake your hand and personally welcome you this morning. Now, this morning we are starting a brand new series entitled Weapons of Self-Destruction. Weapons of Self-Destruction. And what we're doing in this seven-week series is we are going through each one of the seven deadly sins. Now, the hope, our goal with this series is to prove to you that these seven deadly sins are actually more like the seven daily sins, okay? One of the things with the word deadly is it it seems so far away, right? It feels like, ah, I might do that, I might not do that. But what we're going to see in this series is that the seven deadly sins are actually much more seven daily sins than they are deadly. And so the goal of this series is to show you that these sins, these, these habits, these patterns are hindering at best and halting at worst our spiritual, our spiritual growth. And so this morning we are starting with the first sin of the seven deadly sins, which is the sin of pride, the sin of pride. And what we're going to do this morning is we are going to look at the sin of pride under two headings, under two headings. We are going to look at the problem of pride, and we are going to look at the solution for pride. So we're going to look at the problem of it, and then we are going to look at the solution for it, okay? So we're going to spend a little bit more time on the problem because you might not know this, but pride is a very, very big problem, okay? So what I want to do as we jump into the problem is I want to read to you a verse that's found two places in the New Testament. You can go ahead and put that up for me. Thank you. Here's what it says. It's found both in James chapter 4, verse 6, and in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. It's one of those few verses that's quoted more than once in the New Testament. And here's what it says. God opposes the what? All right, it's a little early. I know it's snowy out. It's April. All right, but let's, 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 okay with me, okay? So it says, God opposes the what? But shows favor to the humble. Okay? Now, both James and Peter are making reference to a passage that's actually found in the Old Testament. And here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 3. It says, he mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. Okay, so, so that's kind of where they're getting that verse from. Now, go to the previous verse again, and this is where we're going to spend a lot of my, our time here this morning. So here's, here's what I want to do. As, as we define Right? As we deal with this problem, I want to begin quickly with a definition of pride. What, what does pride actually mean? Okay? Now, the word there in the Greek, proud, here's what it means. It means to be arrogant or haughty. Arrogant or haughty. Now, for those of you who are kind of uh, familiar with the Bible, you know that that word haughty is actually used in the Old Testament. It says that one of the things that God detests, it says God detests haughty eyes. And in the Hebrew, the word haughty, it literally means to be elevated. So when we think of haughty, I always thought that haughty meant how you look at others. It includes that, but it also includes how you view yourself. So to have haughty eyes, it means you look down on others because you're too busy looking up at yourself. So in the Greek, the word proud there, it means arrogant and it means haughty. What it also means, and I found this fascinating, it means to appear like you are above others. So, so don't miss that. It doesn't say that you actually have to be above others. You only have to appear like you're above others. As long as it looks like it, you're good, right? Now, the same word proud, what's fascinating about the Greek language is that the word proud, there's many different Greek words for the word proud. And in Corinthians, Paul uses the word proud, but it has a completely different meaning. Here's what the the Greek word that Paul uses there means. It means to be an overinflated windbag. That's literally what it means in the Greek. To be proud, in light of Scripture, means to be an overinflated windbag. Walking out with your chest puffed out, acting like you are bigger than what you actually are. So let me put it to you like this. To be prideful, you have to take both God's place and his praise. That's what a prideful person does. They take God's place 
and they take God's praise. So what we see is that they are both self-reliant and self-promoting. A prideful person is self-reliant and self-promoting. They take God's place and they take God's praise. Now, that's the biblical definition. Now, I want to give you a definition from a very well-known Christian writer, C.S. Lewis. Uh, Here's what he says. I love this definition. You ready? He says, pride is ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration on the self. That's all it is. Pride is ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration on the self. Now, what I find fascinating about that is this week I came across uh, this author who he used this example to describe pride. And I think it goes with with Lewis's definition. He said that pride, a prideful person is like a black hole. Everything gets sucked into and drawn to them. So everything that they experience in life, every conversation, every event, every moment, in some way, shape, or form has to do with them, even though it doesn't. So if someone gets married on Facebook, that has to do with them. I'm not married. Why am I not married? If someone gets engaged, I'm not engaged. Why why do I get engaged? Everything, every moment, every circumstance, every event in this person's life, every conversation gets sucked right back to them. It's a black hole. Literally, pride is a black hole that sucks everything into you. The way I heard it described this week is that pride is, as, we, as we continue with this series, the reason why pride is first is because pride is the root and every other deadly sin is the fruit. In other words, pride is like the Petri dish in which all the other sins grow. That's why pride is so dangerous. It's so dangerous, in fact, that look what else C.S. Lewis says. He says, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Then he says, unchastity Anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are, a mere, are mere flea bites in comparison. Pride leads to every other vice. I heard it described this week as pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It, it's, it's there. You don't know it's there. But it can kill you. And FYI, right now it is killing you. I don't even know you, and I'm telling you that pride is killing you. G.K. Chesterton, who is this theologian, Catholic theologian who died a long time ago, he said that if he only had one sermon to preach, literally one more sermon he died, he said, I would preach on pride. That's how fundamental this sin is. This is the last long quote I had. Well, second to last long quote. This is from Jonathan Edwards. Uh, He was a a, a pastor and a theologian during the Great Awakening. Look how he describes pride. This is why it's carbon monoxide. He says, it is a sin that has, as it were, many lives. If you kill it, it will live still. If you suppress it in one shape, it rises in another. If you think it is all gone, it is there still. Like the coats of an onion, if you pull one form of it off, there's another underneath. We need, therefore, to have the greatest watch imaginable over our hearts and, try, and to cry most earnestly to the great searcher of our hearts for his help. Guys, this is a dangerous issue. This is the issue, which is why we are addressing it First, here are some of the questions that prideful people ask themselves throughout the day. One of the questions they ask all the time is, how am I looking right now? Right, that they're in a meeting or they're with their family or they're in the neighborhood. Or, right? How am I looking right now? They, 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 I wonder what that person is thinking about me. But you know what, though? That person's not thinking about you. Nobody's thinking about you. You know Why? Because they're too busy thinking about themselves. <laughs> That's why Lewis says that pride is so insidious because it's like we're all, we all have competing prides. We're all saying, hey, look at me. And I, no, 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 look, look at me. Hey, hey, hey look, look at me. No one's looking at you. No one notices your new blouse. No one cares about your new shoes. 
Nobody. Nobody sees the, the, that pimple you're worried about. Nobody, because no one sees, they're worried about their pimple. That's why pride is so insidious, because we're all walking around, performing on a stage, and there's no one in the audience, because everyone is focused on themselves. Another question that people who are prideful ask is, why am I not getting thanked? Doesn't anyone care? Does anyone notice me around this house? Does anyone appreciate me at this company? Does anyone see what I'm doing here at this church? Another, another question is that the pride people love to, prideful people love to ask is, what can I get out of this? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, but what, what can I get out of it? What can I get out of it? But essentially, the question that a prideful person asks again and again and again is, what about me? That's the question you're asking again and again and again. What about me? When you're on social media scrolling, you're not thinking about them. You're asking, what about me? You stop on the posts that have something to do with you. So the first thing I want to show you as we address the problem of pride is I want to show you the, the definition. But the next thing I want to show you is that when it comes to pride, there are actually two different types of pride. There are two different forms of pride. And here are the two forms of pride. The first form, which is the form of pride or the type of pride that we normally think of, is the superiority form of pride. Okay? The second form, which is the one we don't normally think of, is the inferiority form of pride. Both of these are pride, but we don't even know it. This pride up here is the pride of elevation, this pride here is the pride of deprecation, okay? So, so let's take a closer look at each one of these because you might, not, you might not struggle with the first one, so you might be thinking, oh, this has nothing to do with me. You're like elbowing your husband. But the reality is you might not struggle with this one, but you definitely then struggle with this one. So let's look at the two forms of pride. The first form of pride, like I mentioned, is the type of pride that we normally think of when we think of pride, right? It's the person who is completely self-focused, completely self-centered, completely self-absorbed. Is the person who is busy worshiping themselves. But here's what this person does. When they do the math, when this person does the math, almost always they end up on top. Okay? That's what makes them the superiority form. They, they compare themselves with others, regardless of what area it is, whether it's in, at work or in a family or in, in education or in, in intelligence. And in the first person, this first group of people, which said is the pride that we usually think of, they compare themselves. And what they determine, more often than not, is that they are better than others. When they do the math, the majority of the time, they come up on top. And then whenever they don't, they usually avoid that area because they only want to be in areas where they're the best. See, those are the people we tend to think of when we think of pride. Those are the self-promoting people, right? But the other form of pride is also pride. Remember what C.S. Lewis said. C.S. Lewis said that pride is just the focus on the self. He doesn't say what you actually think of the self. He just says that pride is the focus on the self. So then you have then, in light of that definition, the other form of pride. The other form of pride are people who are just as self-focused, just as self-absorbed, worshiping themselves just like the other group. The only difference is when they compare themselves, when they do the math, the numbers don't come out in their favor. More often than not, they're on the bottom instead of the top. But they're still just as self-centered. And they're still just as self-absorbed. So on the surface, this one looks like self-promotion. And on the surface, this one looks like self-pity. But the commonality is self they are both fully focused on the self. Look how John Piper puts this. He compares the two types of pride. He said boasting is the response of pride to success, right? So self-promotion is the response of pride to success. Self-pity is the response of pride to suffering. Boasting says, I deserve admiration because I have achieved so much. Self-pity says, I deserve admiration because I have suffered so much. 
Boasting is the voice of the pride in the heart of the strong. Self-pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the weak. Boasting sounds self-sufficient. Self-pity sounds self-sacrificing. The reason, listen to this, the reason self-pity does not look like pride is that it appears to be so needy. But the need arises from a wounded ego. It doesn't come from a sense of unworthiness, but from a sense of unrecognized worthiness. It is the response of unapplauded pride. So, so, so maybe up to this point, you've been married to, uh, to, to the first form of pride. And this whole time you've been thinking, man, my husband needs to hear this. And you might be then struggle with the other form. But you are just as self-centered. You are just as self-absorbed. You're not worshiping God because you're too busy worshiping yourself. You know, what's funny this week is I was uh, talking to, to my wife about this. Because I, I actually, one of my favorite books that, I, that I've had a chance to, to read over the past few years is the, in the Screwtape Letters uh, by C.S. Lewis. It's one of my favorite books I've ever read. And for those of you who don't know the Screwtape Letters, it's, it's an older demon talking to a younger demon about how to tempt people. And so the younger demon has this patient, this Christian that he's supposed to be tempting. And here's what's fascinating about that story. The older demon says to the younger demon, he says, listen, here's how you keep this person prideful. You make him think that pride is the superiority form of pride. And you make him think that humility is the inferiority form of pride. So, so, so the, the guy, the patient, when, when he's boasting and, and he's doing well, make him think that's pride. So then when he starts to feel bad about it and tries to do humility, he doesn't go from that to humility. He just goes from that to self-pity, from self-promotion to self-pity. He said, don't ever let them know what the true definition of humility is. Lewis says that the true definition of humility is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. See, we always thought that to be humble, I got to say, oh, Chucks, I'm not good at that. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not good at that either. Oh, don't even, you don't even want to see me try that. that no, that's not, that's not humility. That's to think less of yourself. That's, that's self-pity. He says that humility is not to think less of yourself. It's to think of yourself less. A real humble person is no longer thinking about themselves. You, you, you know you've been in the presence of a humble person, not because they told you, but because when you're around them, they're asking you questions. They want to know how you're doing. They want to tell you what God has done in their life. It's all about God and others. That's how you know when you've been in front of a humble person. It's not because they, they think of themselves less. It's not because they think less of themselves, but because they think of themselves less. So this week, I, I'm talking to my wife. And uh, I say to her, you know, honey, I'm working on this sermon. And I told her about the two forms of pride. And I'm like, well, you know, wh which one do you think I struggle with? Which is never a good question, right? Like you don't, don't, <laughs> don't ever ask your spouse about pride. Uh, and I'm like, do you think I struggle with, you know, elevation or, or deprecation? Do you feel, is it, is it superiority or inferiority? She's like, actually, it's both. I'm like, oh, it's like that? Like, <laughs> okay, let's go. Guess we're fighting. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, she said, she said this, is, this is what you are every weekend. Every weekend you're working on your sermon and going into Sunday, you're like, honey, I think this is going to be one of my best ones. This is it. It's going to be one of my best. She's like, the moment you finish, we're driving home. You're like, honey, I think I preached one of my worst. That was terrible. I'm done with ministry. I quit. So literally, it, it, within hours, I go from the superiority form of pride to the inferiority form. But the focus is still on me. So what's fascinating is that self-promotion and self-pity look very different on the surface. But what we see is that they are different masks covering the same sin. Self-promotion and self-pity look very different, but they're covering up the same exact sin. So here's what I want to do just for uh, the next few minutes as we finish looking at the problem of pride. Is I want to give you just very quickly, I want to give you some of the symptoms that you might dis be displaying this morning uh, if you are a prideful person. Okay? Now, I'm not a doctor, right? So, so this is like a WebMD type thing. Okay? I'm, I'm going to just give you some symptoms. If you're a hypochondriac, this is perfect. Okay? Some symptoms that you might be displaying if you are a prideful person. 
Okay, the first two we already looked at, right? Self-pity and self-promotion. So if you're taking notes, let, go ahead and jot these down. The first symptom of a prideful person is self-pity. The, the second symptom of a prideful person is self-promotion. The third symptom, though, is self-preservation. Self-preservation. Now, now, what do I mean by self-preservation? See, a, hum, a, a, a really prideful person, what they're most concerned about they are concerned about their name and their reputation. That's all a prideful person is concerned about. And since that's the case, they're not really concerned about God's name and God's reputation. So when push comes to shove, whenever you are put in a position between choosing your name and your reputation or God's name and his reputation, you are always going to go with the former. So if you're at work and you have a chance to stand up for God, but it's not going to make you look that popular with the other, the other employees, you're not going to say anything about God because it's ultimately not about God. It's about how you look. That's the danger there. See, see, that's why the first commandment is to love God, right? To, to, to don't worship any other gods other than me. One of the gods that God is talking about is you. Don't worship yourself more than me. Because if you worship yourself more than me, you're going to be tempted to exaggerate stories to look better. You're going to be willing to lie in order to look better. You're going to be tempted to, to keep the, the information that maybe is more embarrassing so that you look better with your small group. Because you're not really worried about God's name and his reputation. You're worried about your name and your reputation. So self-preservation is another symptom. Another symptom, and this is probably one of the most dangerous ones, is self-righteousness. Here's the danger about pride. Here's why pride is so insidious. Here's why pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. Because pride is one of those few sins that you smuggle into Christianity. It comes with you and you don't even realize it. So maybe before you met Jesus, you were a prideful businessman and now you're a prideful Pharisee. It just comes with you. It's like a carry-on. And if you're not careful, you might be struggling with self-righteousness and don't even know that you're struggling with self-righteousness. So think about this. Luke 18, you have the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the tax collector, it says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Pharisee is saying, man, thank you for not making me like that guy. I guarantee you, if you would have showed up in that parable and accused the, the, the Pharisee of self-righteousness, he would have been like, what? No. But that's why self-righteousness is so dangerous. You don't see it. A lot of us are self-righteous, and maybe we're self-righteous when it comes to politics, so anyone who votes different from us is evil. Or maybe we're self-righteous when it comes to our morals, so anyone who behaves different from us is evil. Or maybe we're self-righteous when it comes to our parenting, so anyone who parents different from us is less than. That's the problem with self-righteousness. Many of us, listen, many of us are, are raising our kids, we're raising self-righteous kids. We're not raising gospel-centered kids. We are telling our kids you tell them, hey, don't do that because that's what bad people do. They are bad people. What are you doing? They are sinners. There are no such thing as good people and bad people. The only reason why you think there's bad people is because the, 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 the bad people are comparing themselves to worse people. And so we raise our kids up in this self-righteous conditional world and then we're, we're, we're shocked that they don't accept a, a gospel that's so we're, we teach them there's an, a conditional world out there, and then we're shocked when they grow up, they don't believe in an unconditional message. The next symptom is you are self-absorbed. Here's what's so fascinating about prideful people. They're self-absorbed, and yet they struggle with self-awareness. How You would think that with all the focus on self, they would be very self-aware, but they actually are not self-aware. They keep talking about themselves, and every conversation ends up with them. Everything always ends up with them. So even though they are self-absorbed, they are not self-aware. I heard one of the pastors here at our church said that he was at a funeral once, and they were describing the deceased, and, and the person doing the eulogy said, this individual was humble, and here's how he proved it. He said, there's only two types of people in the world. There's the people who walk into a room and say, here I am, and then there's the people who walk into the room and say, there you are. Many of us, if we're being honest, when we walk into the room, it's not, hey, there you are, it's, here I am. Hey, let's get the party started. I'm here now. Right? We struggle with empathy. Prideful people are not self-aware because they struggle with empathy. I, I can't be empathetic because I'm too busy thinking about my feelings. They're not good listeners. Okay? 
The next symptom is unforgiveness. You know you're struggling with pride if you're struggling with unforgiveness. Here's why. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about, the, he says the word raka. He says, when you say to your neighbor raka, the word there raka in Aramaic means to, to literally see your neighbor as nothing or less than. So in order to be unforgiving, in order to hold a grudge, you have to look at your neighbor as raka. You have to look at them as less than you. I'm here and you're there. I'm not going to forgive you because I would never do what you did. Ever. But here's what's so insidious about pride. The same pride that keeps you from forgiving others is the same pride that keeps you from forgiving yourself. Because since your opinion is the one that most matters, a prideful person will say, well, I know God's forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. And they stay with the unforgiveness and they can't forgive themselves because their opinion of them matters more than God's opinion of them. That's the thing about pride. It's a two-edged sword. It keeps you from not forgiving others, but it also keeps you from forgiving yourself. Another, another symptom of pride is a lack of spiritual growth. Pride, prideful people don't grow. Because in order to grow, you have to be willing to take feedback. In order to grow, you can't be defensive. In order to grow, you have to be teachable. But think about it. If you struggle with the, the, the superiority form of pride, when someone gives you feedback or criticism, you just minimize it. You're like, pfft. Man, you're less than me, whatever, I got it, I don't even need to hear that. But if you, if you, that's, that's if you struggle with the superiority form. If you struggle with the inferiority form, when someone gives you feedback, you're crushed by it. They're just trying to be helpful and you're co completely crushed. Because all they're doing is proving what you already think about the world, that you are less than. And this is another example that I'm not as good. Another example or another uh, symptom is anxiety. You know that anxiety is one of the clearest pictures of pride? In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And he says, and he will lift you up. And then, he, and then immediately after, he says, casting your cares on him. So Peter connects anxiety with humility. He says, the reason why you're so anxious is because you, you, you know how life should go. And when God doesn't do things the way you would do them, you get anxious. God, I have a plan for my life, and you're messing it up. See, that's, that's, the, that's the danger about pride, right? You, you, one of the, you, pride doesn't ever tell you this, but one of the side effects, one of the, 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 sh the shadow side of sitting on God's throne is that when you sit on his throne, you have to think his thoughts. When I take his throne, I got to think his thoughts. So now I'm worried about things that only God should be worried about. And I'm trying to do things that only God should do. And so I'm staying up at night worried about things that I have no control over. That's why it's so dangerous. Another, another symptom is unbelief. In Psalm 10, verse 4, uh, the psalmist says that the reason why atheists exist is because of pride. So, so pride is why atheists exist. It says that they have no space in their heads for God, it says in Psalm 4. No space. But that unbelief can also affect believers, though. When you struggle with, with unbelief, it's hard for you to acknowledge God. That's why C.S. Lewis says, if you're prideful, all you do is look down on people. But if you spend all your day looking down, then you never have an opportunity to look up to God. I, I can't see God because to see God, I got to look up. But I'm too busy looking down. And so unbelief. Another one is entitlement. If you struggle with entitlement, I know I struggle with entitlement. I don't know if you do, but I know I struggle with entitlement. And, and why? Because when you're prideful, you feel like you deserve the best. But here's the problem with entitlement. Entitlement is so insidious because then here's what it means. You, you can never handle suffering well. You can't handle the bad moments well because that's not how life's supposed to go. Things are supposed to go a, a certain way for me. So, so pride keeps you from handling the bad moments and it keeps you from enjoying the good moments because you have no gratitude. A prideful person can't be thankful because a prideful person deserves everything they get. So when things go right, you, you're not grateful. Life is just going the way it was supposed to go. So it keeps you from handling the bad moments and it keeps you from enjoying the good moments. And the last one is this. The last symptom is prayerlessness. I know I struggle with prayerlessness. 
A prideful person struggles with prayer, and here's why. Prayer is the one time, I heard one pastor say, it's the one time in your life, the only time that you treat God like he's God. The reason why prideful people struggle with prayer is because if I'm busy treating God like he's God, then I have to admit that I'm not God. I don't want to do all that. So what happens is prayer becomes not the, the steering wheel of your life, it becomes the spare tire of your life. It's the break glass in case of emergency option. Now, if you've been sitting here and the whole time I've been going through this list, you've been thinking about someone else, that's a really prideful thing to do. <laughs> so hopefully by now, we all get there's a problem. Amen? Amen? So now that we've seen the severity of the problem, what I want to do with the rest of our time is I want to look at the splendor of the solution. Let me, let me go back to the passage again. It says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, here's what, I don't know how, how you work, but here's how I work. This week, as I, was, as I was working on this message, as I was meditating on that passage, here's what I kept doing. Here's what I kept, what I kept thinking to myself. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I'm so glad, you might be doing this right now, right? You might be thinking, man, I'm so glad I'm here for this sermon. I'm so glad that I, I, I'm reminded of just how prideful and wicked I am. I, I'm, so, I'm so thankful that I know that God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. So here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I got to do. From, from now on, I'm just going to be humble then. I, I got it then. Like seriously, I'm so glad I was here. Thank you so much, Pastor Will, for letting the Spirit move you and, and for letting the Spirit lead you. Man, I, I needed to hear this. I, I got it. Just say amen. I'm going to go fix it right now. I got people to apologize to. I got things to clean up. I got sin to repent of. Here's the problem with that. That's a very prideful response. You know why? Because you are seeking a man-made solution to a man-made problem. Listen, you and I, we are, we are prideful by nature and by choice. It's a man-made problem, so there can't be a man-made solution. You can't be the solution if you're the problem. I can't be the solution if I'm the problem. That's a big problem. And so what we see is that the solution has to come from someone else. The, the solution has to come from somewhere else. It can't be a man-made solution. It has to be a God-made solution. You know, one of the things that, that, I, that, I, that I thought about this week is that in Scripture, we are told that pride comes before the fall, right? Pride comes before the fall. That's in the Bible. But you know, one of the things that I found fascinating is that pride actually not only comes before the fall, but pride came after the fall. It came as a result of the fall. I don't know if you know this, but in Genesis chapter 3, the reason why Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden is because of pride. Satan shows up in the form of a serpent. He tempts them and he says, you will be like God. And so what gets them kicked out of the garden is pride. Ever since that moment, so what we see is that pride not only comes before the fall, pride comes because of the fall. That's why we are sinners by nature and by choice and prideful by nature and by choice because of the fall. So if the problem started back then, then what can we do? Here's what's beautiful. The Bible says that God sent a greater Adam. The first Adam got us into the mess, and God sent a greater Adam with the same title. Here's what's fascinating about this greater Adam. He has the same title. He is tempted by the same enemy with the same temptation. The only difference is, is that the first Adam had everything going for him because he was in the garden and everything was perfect. The, 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 the last Adam says that it, he was in the wilderness and he had nothing going for him. He was hungry. It had been 40 days since he had eaten or drank. And all of a sudden, Satan shows up. The same, certain shows, same Satan shows up and does the same temptation to him. But what's beautiful about the, the, the last Adam, who, who's Jesus, is he, he, here's how he responds. Instead of responding with pride... He responds with humility. Now, there's two reasons why this is so fascinating. There's two reasons why this is so important. The first reason is because he is the first human being ever to not struggle with pride at any point in his life, especially in the moment of temptation like the first Adam. But the second reason why it's so fascinating is because the first Adam had every right to be humble, and yet he chose to be prideful. The last Adam had every right to be prideful and yet chose to be humble. 
Am I preaching right now? I think, I think I'm preaching right now. I just, I'm not sure. It's a little early right now. I'm, I think I'm talking to myself over here. It's okay. So, 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 so here's the thing. So follow me here. The first Adam, he, he gets in trouble because of pride, right? But, but what I find so interesting when you look at Scripture is that you would think that the, the last Adam, because he responded with humility, because he responded appropriately, you would think that at the end of his life, God would show him favor. The Bible says, according to this passage, that God shows favor to the humble. I, I don't know what your Bible says, but that's what mine says. It says, but God shows favor. The word there is grace. God shows grace to the humble. So you would think that the only person who showed humility at the end of his life got God's favor. But what we see is that at the end of his life, he doesn't get God's favor. He got opposition. That's what the word there opposed means. It means hostility. It means resistance. The only person who was humble at the end of his life was opposed. And the question is why? The answer is God treated him the way we deserve so that he can treat us the way he deserved. Listen, at the cross, think about this, at the cross, at the cross, Jesus was treated as opposed so that we might be favored. At the cross, Jesus was treated like he was prideful so that we might be treated like we're humble. At the cross, Jesus was treated like the first Adam so that we might be treated like the last Adam. At the cross, Jesus experienced the lowest shame so that we might experience the highest honor. At the cross, Jesus took upon himself our sinful pride so that we might have a holy humility. Can I get an amen? amen. What we see is that the gospel, it kills pride on two levels. It's, it gives us a one-two punch that you can't find anywhere else. The gospel kills pride on two levels because the, God's law humiliates you, but then God's law elevates you. Sorry, his love. So his law humiliates, but his love elevates. That's, that's crazy. The law of God humiliates you to the dust, but the love of God elevates you to the heavens. It, it does something to you that nothing else can do, which is why the solution has to come from someone else. Because here's what the world tries to do. The world tries to deal with our sin. The world tries to deal with our issue by saying, hey, you're not that bad. By the world, I mean counselors and celebrities and politicians, right? The world tries to, tries to keep the whole pride scheme going by saying, hey, you're not that bad. You're pretty good. You, you can fix it yourself. But God's law shows up and says, no, 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 you are that bad. You are that broken. You are that wicked. You are that depraved. You are that sinful. But guess what? Jesus is better. It completely, it, just, it, it takes everything away. But here's what's so beautiful about the fact that we are broken and that we are sinful. At the cross, Jesus didn't come to die for the spiritually rich. He came to die for the spiritually poor. At the cross, Jesus didn't come to die for the somebodies. He came to die for the nobodies. At the cross, Jesus didn't come to die for the winners. He came to die for the losers. At the cross, Jesus didn't come to die for the dominant. He came to die for the defeated. At the cross, Jesus didn't come to die for the first. He came to die for the lost. At the cross, Jesus didn't die for the healthy. He came to die for the sick. Come on, church. So, so it, 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 it just it humiliates you down to the dust, but then it elevates us because Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul gets to a place where he says to the Corinthians, listen, the gospel has so impacted me, the truth of the gospel has so transformed me that not only do, not only do I not care what you think, I don't even care what I think anymore. And he uses court language. He says God's verdict has already been given. And Paul says the court has been adjourned. The, the, the trial is over. The verdict is in. The judge has decided. The case is closed. He said, I'm already loved. I'm already accepted. I'm already approved of. I'm already justified. I'm already pardoned. And if that's true, then who cares what you think and who cares what I think? God loves me. So what we see in Scripture what we see that the gospel does, the gospel doesn't remove our pride. The gospel doesn't necessarily remove our boasting. It redirects our boasting. It redirects it. Remember what I said about the gravitational pull. There's this gravitational pull. We are a black hole that sucks everything else towards, towards us. The gospel gives us a stronger gravitational pull named Jesus. 
And so all of a sudden, our, we're still boasting, but we're no longer boasting in ourselves. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, may I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's boasting in Jesus now. He says, I have been crucified with him. It's no longer I who live, but him who lives in me. He's gone from being self-centered to being Christ-centered. The gospel gives you another thing to boast in. So what we see is that because of the law, the problem is much worse than we thought. But because of the love, it's much better than what we expected. If the greatest example of pride is man becoming God, then that means the greatest example of humility is God becoming man. And when you understand that, you start to grow in humility. You don't think less of yourself. You think of yourself less. To the degree that you see Jesus replacing you and remembering you at the cross, to that same degree you will forget yourself and boast in him. Amen? Let's pray.